Welcome to another episode of Mike Reads. Tonight we'll be beginning our series on Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. This is the 40th anniversary edition. This read is something of a follow-up on a precursory uh, review that I did of this book. So link is in this video's description to that review so you can get a good idea of my thoughts going into this read, which we will follow up on uh, with another review as soon as we are done with this read. For tonight, what we're going to be reading are the prefaces and the introductory uh, sections of this book before we get into the meat of the book, which will be which will begin with chapter one in our next read. So without further ado, let's dive into tonight's read, which begins with Preface 2002. In my preface to the 1982 edition of this book, I documented a dramatic shift in the climate of opinion, manifested in the difference between the way this book was treated when it was first published in 1962 and the way my wife's and my subsequent book, Free to Choose, presenting the same philosophy, was treated when it was published in 1980. That change in the climate of opinion developed while and partly because the role of government was exploding under the influence of initial welfare state and Keynesian views. In 1956, when I gave lectures that my wife helped shape into this book, government spending in the United States, federal, state, and local, was equal to 26% of national income. Most of this spending was on defense. Non-defense spending was 12% of national income. 25 years later, When the 1982 edition of this book was published, total spending had risen to 39% of national income, and non-defense spending had more than doubled, amounting to 31% of national income. That change in the climate of opinion had its effect. It paved the way for the election of Margaret Thatcher in Britain and Ronald Reagan in the United States. They were able to to curb Leviathan, though not to cut it down. Total government spending in the United States did decline slightly from 39% of national income in 1982 to 36% in 2000, but that was almost all due to a reduction in spending for defense. Non-defense spending fluctuated around a roughly constant level, 31% in 1982, 30% in 2000. The climate of opinion received a further boost in the same direction when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989 and the Soviet Union collapsed in 1992. That brought to a dramatic end an experiment of some 70 years between two alternative ways of organizing an economy, top-down versus bottom-up, central planning and control versus private markets, more colloquially, socialism, versus capitalism. The results of that experiment had been foreshadowed by a number of similar experiments on a smaller scale. Hong Kong and Taiwan versus mainland China. West Germany versus East Germany. South Korea versus North Korea. But it took the drama of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union to make it part of conventional wisdom so that it is now taken for granted that central planning is indeed the road to serfdom, as Friedrich A. Hayek titled his brilliant 1944 polemic. What is true for the United States and Great Britain is equally true for the other Western advanced countries. In country after country, the initial post-war decades witnessed exploding socialism, followed by creeping or stagnant socialism. And in all these countries, the pressure today is toward giving markets a greater role and government a smaller one. I interpret the situation as reflecting the long lag between opinion and practice. The rapid socialization of the post-World War II decades reflected the pre-war shift of opinion toward collectivism, The creeping or stagnant socialism of the past few decades reflects the early effects of the post-war change of opinion. Future desocialization will reflect the mature effects of the change in opinion reinforced by the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
the change in opinion has had an even more dramatic effect on the formerly undeveloped world. Excuse me, underdeveloped world. That has been true even in China, the largest remaining explicitly communist state. The introduction of market reforms by Deng Xiaoping in the late 70s, in effect privatizing agriculture, dramatically increased output and led to the introduction of additional market elements into a communist command society. The limited increase in economic freedom has changed the face of China, strikingly confirming our faith in the power of free markets. China is still very far from being a free society, but there is no doubt that the residents of China are freer and more prosperous than they were under Mao, freer in every dimension except the political. And there are even the first small signs of some increase in political freedom manifested in the election of some officials in a growing number of villages. China has far to go, but it has been moving in the right direction. In the immediate post-World War II period, the standard doctrine was that development of the Third World required central planning plus massive foreign aid. The failure of that formula, wherever it was tried, as was pointed out so effectively by Peter Bauer and others, and the dramatic success of the market-oriented policies of the East Asian tigers, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, has produced a very different doctrine for development. By now, many countries in Latin America and Asia, and even a few in Africa, have adopted a market-oriented approach and a smaller role for government. Many of the former Soviet satellites have done the same. In all those cases, in accordance with the theme of this book, Increases in economic freedom have gone hand-in-hand with increases in political and civil freedom and have led to increased prosperity. Competitive capitalism and freedom have been inseparable. A final personal note, it is a rare privilege for an author to be able to evaluate his own work 40 years after it first appeared. I appreciate very much having the chance to do so. I am enormously gratified by how well the book has withstood time and how pertinent it remains to today's problems. If there is one major change I would make, it would be to replace the dichotomy of economic freedom and political freedom with the trichotomy of economic freedom, civil freedom, and political freedom. After After I finished the book, Hong Kong, before it was returned to China, persuaded me that while economic freedom is a necessary condition for civil and political freedom, political freedom, desirable desirable though it may be, is not a necessary condition for economic and civil freedom. Along these lines, the one major defect in the book seems to me an inadequate treatment of the role of political freedom, which under some circumstances promotes economic and civic freedom and under under others inhibits economic and civic freedom. Signed, Milton Friedman, Stanford, California, March 11, 2002. Preface, 1982. The lectures that my wife helped shape into this book were delivered a quarter of a century ago. It is hard even for persons who were then active, let alone for the more than half of the current population, who were less than 10 years old or had not yet been born, to reconstruct the intellectual climate of the time. Those of us who were deeply concerned about the danger of freedom and prosperity from the growth of government, from the triumph of welfare state and Keynesian ideas, were a small beleaguered minority regarded as eccentrics by the great majority of our fellow intellectuals. Even seven years later, when this book was first published, its views were so far out of the mainstream that it was not reviewed by any major national publication, not by the New York Times or the Herald Tribune, then still being published in New York, or the Chicago Tribune, or by Time or Newsweek, or even the Saturday Review, 
though it was reviewed by the London Economist and by the major professional journals. And this for a book directed at the general public, written by a professor at a major university, U.S. university, excuse me, and destined to sell more than 400,000 copies in the next 18 years. It is inconceivable that such a publication by an economist of comparable professional standing, but favorable to the welfare state or socialism or communism, would have received a similar silent treatment. How much the intellectual climate has changed in the past quarter century is attested to by the very different reception that greeted my wife's and my book, Free to Choose, a direct lineal descent of capitalism and freedom, presenting the same basic philosophy and published in 1980. That book was reviewed by every major publication, frequently in a featured, lengthy review. It was not only partly reprinted in Book Digest, but also featured on the cover. Free to Choose sold some 400,000 hardcover hardcover copies in the U.S. in its first year and has been translated into 12 foreign languages and was issued in early 1981 as a mass market paperback. The difference in reception of the two books cannot, we believe, be explained by a difference in quality. Indeed, the earlier book is the more philosophical and abstract, and hence more fundamental. Free to Choose, as we said in its preface, has, quote, more nuts and bolts less theoretical framework, end quote. It complements rather than replaces capitalism and freedom. On a superficial level, the difference in reception can be attributed to the power of television. Free to Choose was based on and designed to accompany our PBS series of the same name, and there can be little doubt that the success of the TV series gave prominence to the book. That explanation is superficial because the existence and success of the TV program itself is testimony to the change in the intellectual climate. We were never approached in the 1960s to do a TV series like Free to Choose. There would have been few, if any, sponsors for such a program. If, by any chance, such a program had been produced, there would have been no significant audience receptive to its views. No, the different reception of the latter book, of the later book, and the success of the TV series are common consequences of the change in the climate of opinion. The ideas in our two books are still far from being in the intellectual mainstream, but they are now, at least, respectable in the intellectual community and very likely almost conventional among the broader public. The change in the climate of opinion was not produced by this book or the many others, such as Hayek's Road to Serfdom and Constitution of Liberty, in the same philosophical tradition. For evidence of that, it is enough to point to the call for contributions to the symposium Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, issued by the editors of Commentary in 1978, which went in part, quote, the idea that there may be an inescapable, an inescapable connection between capitalism and democracy has recently begun to seem plausible to a number of intellectuals who w- once would have regarded such a view not only as wrong, but even as politically dangerous, end quote. My contribution of an extensive quotation from Capitalism and Freedom, a briefer one from Adam Smith, and a closing invitation, quote, welcome aboard, end quote. Even in 1978, of the 25 contributors to the symposium other than myself, only nine expressed views that could be classified as sympathetic to the central message of Capitalism and Freedom. The change in the climate of opinion was produced by experience, not by theory or philosophy. Russia and China, once the great hopes of the intellectual classes, had clearly gone sour. Great Britain, whose Fabian socialism exercised a dominant influence on American intellectuals, was in deep trouble. 
closer to home, the intellectuals, always devotees of big government and by wide majorities, supporters of the National Democratic Party, had been disillusioned by the Vietnam War, particularly the role played by President Kennedy and Johnson. Many of the great reform programs, such Gideons, such Gideons of, of the past as welfare, public housing, support of trade unions, integration of schools, federal aid to education, affirmative action, were turning to ashes. As with the rest of the population, their pocketbooks were being hit with inflation and high taxes. These phenomena, not the persuasiveness of the ideas expressed in books dealing with the principles, explain the transition from the overwhelming defeat of Barry Goldwater in 1964 to the overwhelming victory of Ronald Reagan in 1980, two men with essentially the same program and the same message. What, then, is the role of books such as this? Twofold, in my opinion. First, to provide subject matter for bull sessions. As we wrote in the preface to Free to Choose, quote, the only person who can truly persuade you is yourself. You must turn the issues over in your mind at leisure, consider the many arguments, let them simmer, and after a long time, turn your preferences into convictions, end quote. Second, and more basic, to keep options open until circumstances make change necessary. There is n- enormous inertia, a tyranny of the status quo, and private and especially governmental arrangements. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. A personal story will perhaps make my point. Sometime in the late 1960s, I engaged in a debate on universe, on, at the University of Wisconsin with Leon Kaiserling, an unreconstructed collect, collectivist. His clinching blow, as he thought, was to make fun of my views as utterly reactionary, and he chose to do so by reading, from the end of chapter 2 of this book, the list of items that I said, quote, cannot, so far as I can see, validly be justified in terms of the principles outlined above, end quote. He was doing very well with the audience of students as he went through my castigation of pr- price supports, tariffs, and so on, until he came to point 11, quote, conscription to man, conscription to man the military services in peacetime, end quote. That expression of my opposition to the draft brought more ardent applause and lost him the audience and the debate. Incidentally, the draft is the only item on my list of 14 unjustified government activities that has so far been eliminated. And that victory is by no means final. In respect of many of the other items, we have moved still further away from the principles espoused in this book, which is, on one hand, a reason why the climate of opinion has changed, and, on the other, evidence that that change has so far had little practical effect. Evidence also that the fundamental thrust of this book is as pertinent to 1981 as to 1962, even though some examples and details may be outdated. The Original Preface This book is a long-delayed product of a series of lectures that I gave in June 1956 at a conference at Wabash College directed by John Van Sickle and Benjamin Rogue and and sponsored by the Volcker Foundation. In subsequent years, I have given similar lectures at Volcker Conferences directed by Arthur Kemp, at Claremont College directed by Clarence Philbrook, at the University of North Carolina 
and directed by Richard Leftwich at Oklahoma State University. In each case, I cover the contents of the first two chapters of this book, dealing with principles, and then applied the principles to a varied set of special problems. I am indebted to the directors of these conferences not only for inv- inviting me to give the lectures, but even more for their criticisms and comments on them, and for friendly pressure to write them up in tentative form, and to Richard Cornell, uh, Kenneth T- Templeton, and Ivan Beerley of the Volker Foundation, who were responsible for arranging the conferences. I am indebted also to the participants who, by their incisive probing and deep interest in the issues, and unquenchable intellectual enthusiasm, forced me to rethink many points and to correct many errors. This series of conferences stands out as among the most uh, stimulating intellectual experiences of my life. Needless to say, there's probably not one of the directors of the conferences or participants in them who agrees with everything in this book. But I trust they will not be unwilling to assume some of the responsibility for it. I owe the philosophy expressed in this book and much of its detail to many teachers, colleagues, and friends. Above all, to a, st- to a distinguished group I have been privileged to associate with at the University of Chicago. Frank H. Knight, Henry C. Simons, Lloyd W. Mintz, Aaron Director, Friedrich A. Hayek, George J. Stigler. I ask their pardon for my failure to acknowledge specifically the many ideas of theirs which they will find expressed in this book. I have learned so much from them, and what I have learned has become so much a part of my own thought that I would not know how to select points to footnote. I dare not try to list the many others to whom I am indebted, lest I do some an injustice by inadvertently omitting their names. But I cannot refrain from mentioning my children, Janet and David, whose willingness to accept nothing on faith has forced me to express technical matters in simple language and thereby improve both my understanding of the points and, hopefully, my exposition. I hasten to add that they too accept only responsibility, not identity of my views. Excuse me, not identity of views. I have drawn freely from material already published. Chapter 1 is a revision of material published earlier under the title used for this book in Felix Morley, Essays in Individual in Individuality, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 1958, and in still a different form under the same title in The New Individualist Review, Volume 1, Number 1, published in April 1961. Chapter 6 is a revision of an article by the same title, first published in Robert A. Solo, Economics and the Public Interest, published by Rutgers University Press, 1955. Bits and pieces of other chapters have been taken from various of my articles and books. The refrain, quote, but for my wife, this book would not have been written, end quote, has become a commonplace in academic place uh, prefaces. In this case, it happens to be the literal truth. She pieced together the scraps of the various lectures, coalesced different versions, translated lectures into something more closely approaching written English, and has throughout been the driving force in getting the book finished. The, the acknowledgement on the title page is an understatement. My secretary, Marioli Porter, has been an efficient and dependable resource in time of need, and I am very much in her debt. She typed most of the manuscript as well as many earlier drafts of part of it. <clears throat> Introduction In a much-quoted passage in his inaugural address, President Kennedy sa- said, quote, Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country, end quote. It is a striking sign of the temper of our times that the controversy about this passage centered on its origin and not on its content. 
Neither half of the statement expresses a relation between a citizen and his government that is worthy of the ideals of free men in a free society. The paternalistic, quote-unquote, what your country can do for you, implies that government is the patron, the citizen the ward, a view that is at odds with the free man's belief in his own responsibility for his own destiny. The organismic, quote-unquote, what you can do for your country, implies that government is the master, or the deity, the citizen, the servant, or the, vo- or the votary. To the free man, the country is the, co- is the collection of individuals who compose it, not something over and above them. He is proud of a common heritage and loyal to common traditions, but he regards government as a means, an instrumentality, neither a grantor of favors and gifts, nor a master or god to be blindly worshipped and served. He recognizes no national goal, except as it is the consensus of the goals that the citizens severally serve. He recognizes no national purpose, except that it is as it is the consensus of the purposes for which the citizens severally strive. The free man will ask neither what his country can do for him, nor what he can do for his country. He will ask rather, quote, What can I and my compatriots do through government, end quote? to help us discharge our individual responsibilities, to achieve our several goals and purposes, and above all, to protect our freedom. And he will accompany this question with another. How can we keep the government we create from becoming a Frankenstein that will destroy the very freedom we establish it to protect? Freedom is a rare and delicate plant. Our minds tell us, and history confirms, that the great threat to freedom is the concentration of power. Government is necessary to preserve our freedom. It is an instrument through which we can exercise our freedom. Yet, by concentrating power in political hands, it is also a threat to freedom. Even though the men who wield this power initially be of good will, and even though they be not corrupted by the power they exercise, the power will both attract and form men of a different stamp. How can we benefit from the promise of government while avoiding the threat of of freedom, the threat to freedom, excuse me? Two broad principles embodied in our Constitution give an answer that has preserved our freedom so far though they have been violated repeatedly in practice while proclaimed as precept. First, the scope of government must be limited. Its major function must be to protect our freedom, both from the enemies outside our gates and from our fellow citizens. To preserve law and order, to enforce private contracts, to foster competitive markets. Beyond this major function, Government may enable us at times to accomplish jointly what we would find it more difficult or expensive to accomplish severally. However, any such use of government is fraught with danger. We should not and cannot avoid using government in this way. But there should be a clear and large balance of advantages before we do. By relying primarily on voluntary cooperation and private enterprise in both economic and other activities, we can ensure that the private sector is a check on the powers of the governmental sector and an effective protection of freedom of speech, of religion, and of thought. The second broad principle is that government power must be dispersed. If government is to exercise power, better in the county than in the state, better in the state than in Washington. If I do not like what my local community does, be it in sewage, disposal, or zoning, or schools, I can move to another local community, and though few may take this step, the mere possibility acts as a check. If I do not like what my state does, I can move to another. 
If I do not like what Washington imposes, I have few alternatives in this world of jealous nations. The very difficulty of avoiding the, en the enactments of the federal government is of course the great attraction of centralization to many of its proponents. It will enable them, more effectively they believe, to legislate programs that, as they see it, are in, are in the interest of the public, whether it be the transfer of income from the rich to the poor or from private to governmental purposes. They are, in a sense, right. But this coin has two sides. The power to do good is also the power to do harm. Those who control the power today may not tomorrow. And more important, what one man regards as good, another may regard as harm. The great tragedy of the drive to centralization, as of the drive to extend the scope of government in general, is that it is mostly led by men of good will who will be the first to rue its consequences. The preservation of freedom is the protective reason for limiting and decentralizing governmental power. But there is also a constructive reason. The great advances of civilization, whether in architecture or painting, in science or literature, in industry or agriculture, have never come from centralized government. Columbus did not set out to seek a new route to China in response to a majority directive of a parliament, though he was partly financed by an absolute monarch. Newton and Leibniz, Einstein and Bohr, Shakespeare, Milton and Pasternak, Whitney, McCormick, Edison and Ford, Jane Addams, Florence Nightingale, and Albert Schweitzer, and Albert Schweitzer no one of these opened new frontiers in human knowledge and understanding in literature and technical possibilities or in the relief of human misery in response to governmental directives. Their achievements were the product of individual genius, of strongly held minority views, of a social climate permitting variety and diversity. <clears throat> Government can never duplicate the variety and diversity of individual action. At any moment in time, by imposing uniform standards in housing, or nutrition, or clothing, government could undoubtedly improve the level of living of many individuals. By imposing, imposing uniform standards in schooling, road, road construction, or sanitation, central government could undoubtedly improve the level of performance in many local areas and perhaps even on the average of all communities. But in the process, government would replace progress by stagnation. It would substitute uniform mediocrity for the variety essential for that experimentation which can bring tomorrow's laggards above today's mean. This book discusses some of these great issues. Its me major theme is the role of competitive capitalism, the organization of the bulk of economic activity through private enterprise operating in a free market, as a system of economic freedom and a necessary condition for political freedom. Its minor theme is the role that government should play in a society dedicated to freedom and relying primarily on the market to organize economic activity. The first two chapters deal with these issues on an abstract level, in terms of principles rather than concrete application. The later chapters apply these principles to a variety of particular problems. An abstract statement can conceivably com be complete and exhaustive, though this ideal is certainly far from the realized, far from realized, excuse me, in the two chapters that follow. The application of the principles cannot even conceivably be exhaustive. Each day brings new problems and new circumstances. That is why the role of the state can never be spelled out once and for all in terms of specific functions. It is also why we need from time to time to re-examine the bearing of what we hope are unchanged principles on the problems of the day. A byproduct is inevitably a retesting of the principles and a sharpening of our understanding of them. <clears throat>
It is extremely convenient to have a label for the, for the political and economic viewpoint elaborated in this book. The rightful and proper label is liberalism. Unfortunately, quote, as a supreme, if, un- uh, if unintended compliment, the enemies of the system of private enterprise have thought it wise to appropriate its label, end quote. So that liberalism has, in the United States, come to have a very different meaning than it did in the 19th century, or does today over much of the continent of Europe. As it developed in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the intellectual movement that went under the name of liberalism emphasized freedom as the ultimate goal and the individual as the ultimate entity in the society. It supported laissez-faire at home as a means of reducing the role of the state in economic affairs and thereby enlarging the role of the individual. It supported free trade abroad as a means of linking the nations of the world together peacefully and democratically. In political matters, it supported the development of representative government and of parliamentary institutions, reduction in the arbitrary power of the state, and protection of the civil freedoms of individuals. Beginning in the late 19th century, and especially after 1930 in the United States, the term liberalism came to be associated with a very different emphasis, particularly in economic policy. It came to be associated with a readiness to rely primarily on the state rather than on private voluntary arrangements to achieve objectives regarded as desirable. The catchwords became welfare and equality rather than freedom. The 19th century liberal regarded an extension of freedom as the most effective way to promote welfare and equality. The 20th century liberal regards welfare and equality as either prerequisites of or alternatives to freedom. In the name of welfare and equality, the 20th century liberal has come to favor a revival of the very policies of state intervention and paternalism against which classical liberalism fought. In the very act of turning the clock back to 17th century mercantilism, he is fond of castigating true liberals as reactionary. The change in the meaning attached to the term liberalism is more striking in economic matters than in political. The 20th century liberal, like the 19th century liberal, favors parliamentary institutions, representative government, civil rights, and so on. Yet even in political matters, there is a notable difference. Jealous of liberty, and hence fearful of centralized power, whether in governmental or private hands, the 19th century liberal favored political decentralization. Committed to action and confident of the benefits, ben, beneficence of power so long as it is in the hands of go, a government ostensibly controlled by the electorate, the 20th century liberal favors centralized government. He will resolve any doubt about where power should be located in favor of the state instead of the city, of the federal government instead of the state, and of a world organization instead of a national government. Because of the corruption of the term liberalism, the views that formerly went under that name are now often labeled conservatism. But this is not a satisfactory alternative. The 19th century liberal was a radical, both in the etymological sense of going to the root of the matter, and in the political sense of favoring major changes in social institutions. So, too, must be his modern heir. We do not wish to conserve the state interventions that have interfered so greatly with our freedom, though, of course, we do wish to conserve those that have promoted it. Moreover, in practice, the term conservatism has come to cover so wide a range of views and views so incompatible with one another that we shall no doubt see the growth of hyphenated designations such as libertarian conservative and aristocratic conservative. Partly because of my reluctance to surrender the term to proponents of measures that would destroy liberty, partly because I cannot find a better alternative, 
I shall resolve these difficulties by using the word liberalism in its original sense, as the doctrines, doctrines pertaining to a free man. That concludes tonight's read. Now on to the analysis and review part of the video. All right, welcome to the analysis and review part of the video, which we're going to keep incredibly short and sweet because this is just the introductions and um, the prefaces to the actual read. We'll get more into the analysis and review when we get into the main part of the read, which again will be in the next video with chapter one. So first things first, to get off, get things right off the bat, I was absolutely right. If if these if these prefaces and introductions demonstrate anything, it is that I was absolutely right, at least in when it comes to Milton's, uh, Milton Friedman's intent with this book. And I was also right about the bifurcation of the read post chapter two. Um, so if you guys haven't seen my review, my uh, precursory review, uh, link is in this video's description so you guys can check that out. <clears throat> it was interesting to see how Milton Friedman's views, um, to see how his views about the ball... Uh, it was interesting to see his views about the evolving public opinion, especially in contrast to what's what has how the public opinion has in my eyes changed since two thousand and two, which is to suggest the trend that that uh, Milton Friedman was seeing towards cap towards free markets um, and away from governmental control over those markets has completely reversed. Um, and I would say I would go so far as to say the basic ideas espoused in in the introduction are at this point wholly anathema to the prevailing po uh, political current, especially since we're on YouTube here. Um, if we're referring to the uh, the prevailing political current here on YouTube, especially and with my generation and the younger generation, especially, uh, and it's especially in reference to. Uh, page five, when he talks about the subversion of the word liberalism and what it's come to mean here in the United States as of the last few decades at the absolute most. Uh, I I'm going to focus most of this review uh, on that introduction, which I referenced on when, when we're talking to, uh, when we're referring to page five, as the introduction is where he kind of, where, he, where Friedman lays out his themes. Uh, of the book, which he makes explicitly clear uh, in page four of the introduction, quote, its major theme, this book's major theme, is the role of competitive capitalism, the organization of the bulk of economic activity through private enterprise operating in a free market as a system of economic freedom and a necessary condition for political freedom. That's the most important part of what he's what he, of what it is of the themes that he's espousing its minor theme is the role that government should play in a society dedicated to freedom and relying primarily on the market to organize ac economic activity so the main lesson of this book the main theme that he's going to try to uh, work towards is the idea that in order to have political freedom you have to have economic freedom uh, it, it's a necessary condition for political freedom. So in order for freedom in general and broadly to exist in terms of what how, how government treats you and how people around you uh, treat you, you have to have economic freedom. Um, I think I'm going to go into more detail on my thoughts on that matter and the overall review of the book. He's kind of right and he's kind of not. But he's going to lay out the the what he means more specifically throughout the course of this book. So we'll focus on on uh, my thoughts on that matter when we get to the more specific parts of that claim, and then in the final review of the book, we'll go into greater detail on that matter. Again, this is mostly just confirming my precursory review and my memory of the read from when I read it several months ago and when I finished that read several months ago. Uh, and there's really not much more to say about the introductions than, yeah, it seems like I was right, at least in, in his intent on the matter. Though, I'll close, though, with this, because I think this is this is arguably the most important lesson anyone can learn about anything involved in, in life in general. And that is on the 13th page of his 1982 preface. Well, it's not the 13th page of that preface, but it's in the it's the 13th introductory uh, page, so it's uh, it's romant romanticized X I I I um, from his preface in 1982. Quote: 
the only person who can truly persuade you is yourself, end quote. And this is undeniably true. This is one of the most important lessons you can learn in life. This is something of the lesson that Jordan Peterson was trying to espouse throughout both of his uh, 12 Rules books, uh, which I have reviewed on this book, uh, on this channel. So I'll put a link in the video description so you guys can check out those two videos as well if you'd like. <clears throat> but it is that the only person you can change is yourself. So before you try to uh, see change, let's say, out in the world, do the things that you know you can control for yourself. This is his make your bed. You know that you can make those little steps. Make your bed. And then from there, expand outward, right? I believe one of the primary lesson of 12 Rules for Life, broadly speaking, was uh, get your world, get your home in perfect order before you take on the world. And that's a great lesson to start this series off with, even if it's not really under the main central theme of uh, economics and, and political freedom. So um, we'll be continuing on this read with uh, chapter one uh, in our next read in this series. So until then, it's been Mike signing off.